Hello, everyone. Welcome to K2View's virtual event, Masterclass Test Data Management for Complex Data Environments. With me today are Tali and Leon, who are going to introduce themselves in a moment. Just a couple of housekeeping notes first, please. Uh, this is a masterclass, so we're going to assume that you're familiar with concepts such as test data management, data masking, synthetic data generation. We're not going to explain it. We're going to assume that you know what it means, and we're going to talk about uh, advanced concepts. If you have any questions along the way, please click on the question mark on the top right corner of your screen, and uh, please submit us your questions at the end of the session. Time permitting, we'll answer as many questions as we can. And if we don't answer your question live, then we'll follow up with you uh, after the session to answer your questions. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce my colleagues at K2U. Uh, ladies first, Tali, can you kick us off, please? Hello, uh, my name is Tali. I work in the product management team, UN's team, and I'm a product manager, mainly handle our TV input. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Brodsky. I'm the VP product, part of the R&D organization. I'm within K2View for more than eight uh, years. I'm ending it over to you. Anytime. Great, thank you guys. Uh, Tali, if you could just speak up a little bit, please. I couldn't hear you very, very well. Just doing a sound check. Thank you. Okay. So let's, let's talk about uh, K2View, a little, just a few words about us. If you're not familiar with K2View, so K2View is a data product platform that powers critical operational workloads. Uh, use cases that we, uh, we solve include test data management, data masking, data tokenization, synthetic data generation, and more. That's what we're going to focus on today. Our clients are enterprises and other organizations like governments across a wide range of industries, in particular financial services, telecom, and healthcare. We debuted in Gartner's Magic Quadrant two years ago, and last month Gartner recognized us as a visionary in their Magic Quadrant for data integration. And uh, I highly recommend you see what our customers say about us in Gartner's Peer Insights website. So on our agenda today, we're going to start by talking about the tipping point that test data management is at at the moment, meaning that test data management is winning the hearts and minds of many organizations today. And we're going to explain what are the drivers driving the adoption of test data management. We're going to talk about the challenges that these organizations that are thinking of adopting test data management tools, what challenges they face in their organization and the problems they're looking to solve. And then, then we're going to present a buyer's guide, a list of capabilities that you should consider when looking at test data management tools. We're also going to look at test data management from the organizational perspective, what are the best practices that you should take at the human resources level, at the organizational level, in order to succeed with test data management? And we're going to wrap it up with a modern approach to TDM. So let's start by looking at Gartner's hype cycle for Agile and DevOps and see where test data management is today. Test data management is considered at the early mainstream maturity. That means that according to Gartner's research and their estimates, TDM has penetrated only 20 to 50% of the target audience, and that we are two to five years away from TDM hitting a plateau. What that means is, is that some organizations have not yet adopted any test data management tools, and a majority of them are planning still to introduce tools. Other organizations, especially large enterpri enterprises, have tools in place, commercial tools we're talking about. However, some of them are, lo are looking to adopt new tools. So let's talk about where test data management is today, the tipping point. What are the drivers that is causing 
test data management to be widely adopted. So we're just going to mention, go through the list now quickly, and then we'll dive into, deep, into each one more in depth. So first of all, shift left testing. Uh, hopefully, many of you are familiar with the concept, testing early and often. We'll talk about it. And we'll talk about how to disconnect and to empower software development teams and enable QA teams to not be dependent on, on centralized uh, IT teams and data engineers to provision test data for them, but to empower them to provision test data themselves. And another driver why organizations are looking to introduce TDM is because the rest of their software development lifecycle is using a DevOps methodology, but their test data provisioning is not. So that is um, an important point. We'll talk about cloud and where TDM fits in the cloud. We'll talk about synthetic data generation and different generation techniques. We'll talk about AI. We'll talk about the software side of human resources and the experience of QA teams and development teams. We'll talk about very briefly the need for regulatory compliance. And we'll talk about why existing tools are falling short. So let's talk first about shift left testing. So shift left testing is a concept that hopefully, hopefully you're well familiar with. It's about testing earlier in the software development lifecycle so that you can find defects earlier and fix them earlier because it's a lot cheaper to fix these defects earlier in the process than later. And you can see here on this chart how the cost of fixing defects grows exponentially as you go further into, this, into the uh, development lifecycle. And if the software application, for example, is released to customers and bugs are found, this not only tarnishes the brand, not only uh, gives you a headache from a sales perspective, but the cost to fix it, to refactor the code, grows exponentially. And so by introducing TDM tools, we can prevent a lot of these bugs from creeping in to the code along the way. So let's stop now and do a poll. I want to ask you guys, how long does it take to provision test data in your organization? If you look below the presentation window, you'll see a tab that says vote. Please vote. All answers are anonymous, and you'll see the results tabulated in real time as you respond. We'll give it a moment for people to vote. How long does it take to provision test data in your organization? Less than a day, one day to one week, two to three weeks, four to five weeks, or one to two months. Please find the icon that says vote and let us know how long it takes to provision test data in your organization. Okay, while you guys are voting, um, you guys can see also the results, which I'll refer back to later. I'm going to continue in the interest of time and talk about why it's so hard to provision test data. So test data provisioning without a TDM tool is a very painful process. There's a lot, of, a lot of different data sources where you need to extract data from ETL processes. You need to profile the data, map the schemas, the table relationships, the dependencies. Maybe you'll, you'll need a data catalog. And there's a lot of manual work that needs to go into preparing a test data set, scrubbing the data, of course, masking the data. And since there, if you're using, if you have multiple data sources involved, you want to make make sure that you ensure refer, referential integrity. There are various transformations that you may need to do in order to massage the, the data to get it into the right uh, environment. And all of this takes time. And there's inc increased complexity with the plur 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 proliferation of many data sources, different technologies, different in environments all while the test data needs to be specific, has to be compliant, it has to have sufficient test coverage and, um, and, and other requirements. So without a TDM tool, then you have a situation where the software delivery cycle is slowed down, 
you only have partial test coverage for your software te for your test application testing. Perhaps the product teams don't have confidence in how well the product has been tested. And there's been a lot of manual labor that's gone in to prepare these test data sets, which leads to poor developer and QA experience. Let's talk about the evolution of, of, of this process of manual scripting, what I just described now, the, the time that it takes to provision test data with in-house tools and scripting takes at least weeks, if not months. Now, over time, some organizations, many organizations have adopted tools to automate this. And 15 years ago, companies like IBM and Informatica first introduced uh, TDM tools to the market. And this really helped a lot because it cut the time down to provision test data from months to a much shorter time, either days or, or a week, depending on, uh, on the tool and, and how many and the complexity involved. But where test data management is evolving is a move towards decentralization of test data provisioning, empowering test testers and developers to provision test data themselves on demand and to reduce the time to test data from months to weeks to hours to minutes. One of our customers, AT&T, referred to this when they were talking about why they chose K2View. He specifically, Ward Chonning here, specifically uh, pointed out and mentioned, called out our self-service approach, where they, where they talk about AT&T's desire to, for their testing teams to provision test data themselves without impacting production source systems. Now let's talk about DevOps and automation. The software delivery lifecycle has become more and more automated as organizations have adopted agile and DevOps methodologies. And companies have been breaking up their software development from developing large chunks of software to smaller and smaller chunks of software to the point that we're now committing software multiple times a day perhaps even more than that. But what's often fallen behind, fallen by the wayside, is the test data part. In these organizations where the software development is working at a very fast pace, the test data has failed to keep up and has not become part of the CICD pipeline. And this is a reason why many companies are looking to introduce automation to their uh, to their organization. As we know, the world is moving to the cloud. Leon, can you share with us, please, what are the challenges? Why are people moving to the cloud and where TDM fits in? Okay, thanks, Amitai. So basically the main motivation uh, in order to move to the cloud is that Organizations are looking for a cost reduction, like by auto scaling or scale to zero, high resilience and uh, system modernization, managed services, etc. So, there are plenty of reasons why organization would like to move to the cloud. Uh, once you examine a TDM tool uh, in order to serve your cloud uh, uh, capabilities, is first of all to make sure that it supports the three main leaders in the, the cloud providers uh, industry, like GCP, uh, Azure, and AWS. Uh, you need to make sure that, uh, first of all, all the permutation of cloud services are supported, meaning that if it's fully managed by the vendor that offers the TDM solution, or it's self-hosted by you, by the customer, uh, or a hybrid solution, like some of the cloud services are offered by the vendor and the other ones by the customer. Uh, in addition, you need to make sure also that uh, this TDM uh, uh, solution support any uh, hybrid solution, meaning that you can have in enterprise some uh, on-prem uh, uh, application on the other end and, uh, and also cloud services. So basically you can have in, uh, for example, in a telco industry, so you can have a customer, so the CRM and billing system uh, resist on the on-prem, but the ordering system moved to the cloud. 
So basically, all this permutation should be supported in order to bring all the data from all the different uh, solution, if it's uh, on cloud or on-prem, whatever, and then provision it uh, to the target system. Uh, in addition, of course, since uh, organizations are moving to the cloud, there are many uh, new applications that are launched, and it's really important uh, to make sure that the TDM solutions support all these different uh, technologies, because on one end in enterprise, you need to support the old technologies like uh, Visa, mainframe, whatever. And on the other end, to make sure that you support also all the uh, new brand uh, cloud uh, technologies like uh, uh, Google BigQuery or uh, uh, Kinesis or whatever, any other services that are offered on the cloud. Um, that's all, I'll move it over to you, back. Okay, thank you, Leon. Let's talk about synthetic data for a moment. Here is Gardner's hype cycle for data science and machine learning. And not surprisingly, generative AI is at the peak of the hype cycle. And if you're, if you're like me, when, I, when you open up your LinkedIn, you see lots of posts about AI or anywhere really on the internet. And on, on TV, everybody's talking about AI. And so we see a lot of hype around that. Over the last few years, a number of uh, new startups have come in and are, have developed um, synthetic data generation software capabilities. And it's a very young market. According to Gartner, uh, only 1% to 5% of this potential market has been penetrated. So there's a lot of room to grow. The industry is in its infancy. Now, how is AI related to this? So it's, it's related, for example, to synthetic data generation, but AI is transforming every industry and just about every software company and non-software company out there is looking to see how they can introduce AI into their organization to increase growth and improve efficiency. Now, there are different, you know, different ingredients to this, to this recipe could be large language models, um, natural language processing, text generation, chatbots that talk to customers. What's, what's, what's in common with all of this is that a massive amount of data is needed to train these LLMs. And TDM has a role to play in this for companies who are developing uh, these models. So for example, test data management can be used to subset mass production data to train machine learning models, which we do with synthetic data, for example. And you might want to generate synthetic data sets that mimic real world scenarios, meaning a, a synthetic data set that looks like a real data set and acts like a real data set and has the statistical properties. Or you might want to generate synthetic data to meet specific testing requirements, which we'll, Tali will talk about soon. Now let's talk about tester and developer experience. Beforehand, I asked you to, to vote uh, how long it takes to provision test data in your organization. So looking at the results, we can see about 30% um, voted that it takes them between one day and one week to provision test data in their organization. 14% get the data right away, meaning less than a day, which is in my, you know, it, pretty much on demand or on demand. Uh, another 30% takes them two to three weeks to, for the time for test data to be provisioned. 8% say four to five weeks and 17% say that it takes one to two months for test data to be provisioned. So that's a long time. If you, add, if you take out the less than one day, um, then, you, and then you see that you have about 85% takes at least a week, and you see uh, the majority of people taking two to three weeks or more. So all of that has an impact on the experience of people, real people like you and me. So here's a quote from Gartner uh, in their 2021 Software Engineering Leaders Survey. They, they report as follows, hiring, developing, and retaining talent is one of the top challenges software engineering leaders face today. So earlier we talked about shift lift testing and the, and the 
benefits of testing early and often because you save money that way. But there's another factor here involved, and that is keeping employees happy, retaining talent, reducing churn of employees. And that's also a reason why test data management has, has reached a tipping point and it is becoming more and more prevalent in organizations today. Now, one of the first reasons why companies looked at test data management and the data masking element of test data management is regulatory compliance, right? We're all familiar with this in Europe, GDPR, in the States, standards such as CCPA, CPRA. Uh, what's interesting is that we not only have country-specific acts uh, like Act 25 in Canada, not only do we have individual regulatory standards in individual countries, but um, besides the federal level standards in the United States, you were also starting to see state level regulations proliferate. So for example, besides California, we see state level re privacy regulations in Colorado, Arizona, Texas, Virginia, possibly other states. And I wouldn't be surprised to see this, uh, this trend continue. So just one more word about this. So having a TDM tool that uh, can handle the compliance issue for you in terms of handling PII. And by the way, we some of our customers have our multinational corporations with presences in different parts of the world. And they use our platform differently in different jurisdictions. So for example, they use different data masking algorithms in Europe than they do in the United States because the, the regu regulations and the standards are different in different jurisdictions. So the last driver I want to talk about is that about existing tooling. So um, some of the legacy vendors have shifted their focus away from TDM and the development that they are doing over the last decade are introduced as new, new features and new modules that are typically sold with separate licenses and even a separate UI. Some of the analysts are saying that they see the innovation coming from newer entrants to the space. In addition, one of those uh, original TDM uh, vendors uh, and Pioneer uh, announced last year that they are no longer will support the their on-prem solution for TDM and announce a schedule for ending the life of their technical support. So on one hand, we're seeing less investment in TDM by some players. And on the other hand, we're seeing increased complexity, uh, which I'd like you please, Leon, to talk about. What are the challenges you see today in organizations such as enterprises and governments regarding test data management? Okay, thank you. Um, these are the main challenges. Like the first one is the access to test data from all sources. So I mentioned briefly once I covered the, the cloud platform that there are so many technologies, uh, new branded ones. So it's extremely important once you examine a TDM solution that it covers a dynamic list of sources, meaning that it's not uh, you know, predefined because each time there is a new technology that is exposed and you want to use it. So you need to make sure that uh, your platform is uh, flexible enough in order to support all the different uh, technologies, starting from the older one like mainframe, Visa, MyMS, whatever, going through the uh, uh, SQL uh, technologies like Oracle, DB2, uh, SQL Server, whatever. And then, of course, the as I mentioned, the Aerospike, Kinesis, uh, Google BigQuery, Snowflake, whatever uh, the new branded uh, technologies that were added uh, on the last few years. Uh, so it's really important that you will have a flexible TDM solution that can basically fetch the data from all these different technologies and provision them uh, accordingly to, to the target system. The second point is the PII. The PII is a great challenge uh, now with all the security regulations. You want to identify all the uh, privacy data and to make sure that you mask it uh, in order not to expose it to any uh, uh, unauthorized uh, users. Um, 
when we are dealing with PII, there is, of course, uh, the structured data, like there is a first name, last name, SSN, whatever field, uh, and you want to identify it accordingly and mask it. And there is a semi-structured data, and this is, by the way, surprisingly, is the majority of the data that resists in our customers, in any customer in the industry, according to our experience, is a semi-structured uh, format, meaning that uh, you can identify a PII within XML, JSON, etc. And, of course, unstructured data. So uh, some personal data can be resist on a Word document, PDF, Excel, whatever. So, of course, the challenge here is to find all these type of uh, um, data and to make sure that uh, you identify all the PII used within your organization and uh, mask it accordingly. The third point is uh, waiting for the test data. So even according to your answers, I can see that around 60% answer that uh, it takes between weeks to months in order to provision uh, data into the target system. And we can say that around for around 80% of you, it takes more than a day, let's say, more than a day till months till you bring the data from the point that you are asking for a data till it's really provisioned into your environment. So we can see it's a great challenge uh, in this area in order to make sure that data is up to date and uh, uh, provisioned within a request in, uh, you know, in a very short uh, period. The fourth uh, point is the subset of test data. Like if I have a, a database with a huge uh, volume of data, but I want to test now a specific customer with, uh, I don't know, overpayment cases and uh, uh, it's a business customer, whatever. So I want to bring this kind of customer from production and provision it into UAT. The challenge here is how can I delete this specific customer from URT if it's already exists there, and how basically I can provision it all over again without damaging all the existing data within the target system. The fifth point is basically the to generate the synthetic data. If I want, don't want to expose the uh, sensitive data, so if I have a case of uh, um, there is no reference data in production, so I need to create synthetic data from nothing. Or if I'm using some, and uh, Tali will elaborate more about it, if I want to train AI ML model in order to generate the data based on the production environment. And the last point is basically integration of this data into DevOps uh, pipelines. So there are many requests, like if I'm a developer, I want to develop some something and I want to make sure that as a part of the pipeline that I'm running, once I compile the code, uh, I want to make sure that I can also provision the data into my testing environment in order to run a J unit or QA activities or whatever. So in order to do so, I need to expose some APIs uh, in order to uh, provision the data as a part of the pipeline. So no matter if it's a self-service that can serve the testers or it's on demand, but I need to make sure that the TDM uh, tool will basically support both of the variations, either by request that I will log in into the self-service and uh, provision the data, or I will call API as a part of the pipeline in order to provision the data uh, to the requested environment. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Okay, we're going to move now to our second and last poll for this session. Uh, please, again, look for the vote button. And here's the question. What is, we're look, thinking about the challenges that Leon just um, talked about, what is the biggest challenge your organization faces when it comes to test data? So please find that poll, and we'd appreciate you voting. And uh, while we're waiting for you guys to, to vote, which of these challenges that Leon mentioned is the biggest challenge in your organization? Uh, someone asked, is the session recorded? Uh, and yes, the session is being recorded. Um, you'll automatically get an email after the session with the recording, uh, so not to worry about that. And it's a good opportunity to encourage you, if you have any questions 
throughout the course of this session about what we're talking about or in general about test data management, please send them in and um, we'll, we'll answer them if we can at the end of the session. I see more people voting. So far we see the biggest challenge is integrating test data from different sources. And that resonates well with what we see here at K2View. Um, many of our customers and, and, and potential customers we speak to uh, tell us that they struggle to integrate with test data that they have, uh, integrate to extract data from mainframes that they have, um, some from SAP, uh, some from some have adopted NoSQL databases and um, or there they have some exotic relational databases that they're struggling to extract data from and so having uh, getting test data from these sources are indeed is indeed a common challenge that we have so I'll let you guys continue to vote and uh, we're going to move on and we're going to present now a buyer's guide of capabilities to consider um, if you or someone in your organization is looking now or in the future to adopt a, an, a TDM tool, what are the advanced capabilities that are out there that you should think about and talk to your team, see what their needs are and, um, and, um, and see what's important to look for in a tool. Tali, can you take us through the checklist? Yes, thank you. Uh, Leo just mentioned some of the main challenges of a TDM tool, and I would like to uh, display and talk about some ideas of important capabilities that must be considered in your, when you are searching for a TDM tool. So the first uh, capability that is very important for a TDM is the ability to integrate with any data source. So Leon and you, Amita, I just mentioned uh, the fragmentation of data, many data sources, uh, hybrid deployment sometimes on prem, on cloud, different uh, technologies. Uh, all, also, in many cases, the data of a holistic business driven entity, like a customer, is basically divided and split between these different data sources. So, it's very important, first of all, like Leo mentioned, that the TDM will not be limited in a closed subset of uh, data sources, but will be flexible to work with old legacy and new uh, data sources technology. And also it is very important that the TDM will be able to grab and extract data from different data sources, bring the data together into one holistic view of data, for example, a customer to be provisioned by the for the testing team. Uh, the second one, the next capability, is a role-based access control. Basically, there can be different stakeholders that needs to work with the TDM and needs the TDM capabilities, like the admin or data engineers, uh, users that they need to define the TDM setup definition, they need to define the TDM permissions, uh, in the enable the environment for TDM. This is one side. Another side is uh, another group is the testers that basically needs to provision data. They need to be able to have a sales service uh, to open a task uh, and to ask for a data to be provisioned into this uh, environment. So these are basically based, uh, different groups, different stakeholders with different roles and different uh, capabilities. So this is very important that the TDM will allow and will be flexible enough to give different permissions to each type of a uh, stakeholder, to each type of user. Another one, like Leon mentioned, the automatic PII discovery. This is also highly important uh, to verify that we have an efficient uh, discovery mechanism that can scan the data sources uh, and uh, identify the fields, that the, expense, uh, the sensitive fields that must not be exposed and they apply masking rule for them. This comes with the data masking. Uh, also, synthetic data generation, the capability to generate a fake data synthetic data, whether this is a data mask, a mask of a synthetic of sensitive data or a whole new synthetic data where 
the source data, real data is not available. We will talk about it in more details. CICD integration, like Miguel mentioned, the capability to ex expose API and to integrate the TDM into the CICD pipeline to be able to enable the organization basically to provide the users not only an updated a software version, an updated code, but also a, an on-demand fresh data to test this uh, software. A flexible deployment on-prem, cloud, hybrid, as Leon mentioned, TDM tool must uh, uh, support uh, the cloud domain cloud suppliers like AWS, Azure, Google uh, Cloud, and also to be able to connect and work with the different type of deployments like uh, on-prem, if the billing is on-prem and the CRM in the cloud is vice versa, this is a hybrid or everything is on-prem or everything is in the cloud. Um, also, I would like to mention the TDM functionality, that the functionality is, is basically exposed for development and QA teams uh, via the self-service, the ability to have the data sub setting. So we, to enable the tester, for example, to ask to get provision a uh, 100 customers that live in California have open ticket, have open balance, have the uh, income of more than, I don't know, $100,000 per year. Uh, and having all these business needed parameters without the need to write very uh, complex SQL scripting, without the need to actually know the, the data sources, how it is built and which table holds which data. Uh, data versioning have the ability to keep versions and actually back up the data during the, uh, the testing life cycle, uh, enable the tester basically to create a snapshot every X time, every X minutes or every X hour. So if something goes wrong, the tester can go back and take the latest uh, snapshot and uh, the tester doesn't need to uh, lose all the changes on all the work and all the updates that were made. Uh, data reservation, this is very important when the testing environment is shared between multiple uh, users and one user does not want other user by mistake to override the uh, entities, uh, that the tested entities. So he reserved the entities and no one else can uh, overload the, override them and uh, reload them to the environment. And of course, uh, data transformation capability, data transformation before the entities, before the data is being loaded to the uh, testing farm, to the target environment. A good example can be aging for insurance company, changing the dates or replacing the IDs in order to avoid collision on the target environment and of course uh, data masking. And all these capabilities eventually give the user the ability to move test data set from one environment to another. Yes, Tali, can I can I just jump in for a moment? Thanks for that. Yeah. So we we talked we mentioned synthetic data generation um, startups and vendors that have come into the market over the last few years. We've talked about some of the pioneers who introduced TDM 15 years ago, but I just want to clarify for the audience that you know there are different TDM tools out there, different company, different types of companies calling themselves a test data management tool. But this last bullet that you talked about, about subsetting and versioning test data sets and being able to roll back to previous snapshots, the previous data sets, this is basically uh, what I would call classical test data management. And it's, it's a must if, if for a test data management tool. A synthetic data generation tool that's doing just synthetic data generation uh, is typically not doing that, right? They're, they're generating synthetic data uh, with whatever technique that they're doing. Uh, they may have certain approaches to solve these particular challenges, uh, but I think it's important when, when you need to speak to, uh, when you speak to the testing team to clarify uh, whether they have, uh, as you mentioned, uh, conf you know, uh, conflicts or clashes within the same environment, test data clashes, people overrunning each other's data. Uh, do, they have, do they have issues of rolling back to previous data sets, uh, test data sets, because the test data set was uh, corrupted. Do they have the need of aging? For example, some of our insurance company customers, they need to transform the data and age the data. So some TDM tools 
uh, have transformation capabilities, some have ETL capabilities, some don't. It's important really to, when you're creating your, your buyer's guide, your checklist, to think about all the different scenarios and what you're doing today and what third-party tools are involved today in, in order to manage your test data process and what your wish list is and basically create a pri priority list, a prioritization of what's a must have and what's nice to have. Please, uh, please continue, Tali, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so data masking, uh, we just mentioned, Leon mentioned the need to identify the data masking. This is automatic uh, PII discovery. So after these PII fields are being actually discovered and uh, identified, uh, a masking logic needs to be applied on these uh, fields. And a masking logic can be in, usually will be much more complex than just nulling out and set null or empty values, empty, empty string instead of the original uh, value. Uh, the masking algorithm basically needs to mimic the uh, format, preserve the format of the original data and also needs to mimic and follow the application rules on these uh, fields, uh, first of all, to make the data look look like a real data, and uh, and also to be aligned with the application rules and enable the tester to run the application with all the rules and uh, with the data that look as much as possible like a real data. And this is a very nice example here in our slide. There is a regional one named Jane Lee. Now Jane Lee becomes Samantha Richard. Uh, but you can see the format, for example, if we have an email, email needs to have a certain format. We do not want to generate just a random string. So the email needs to be generated and look like a real email. The same for the SSN, which has its own format. Talk about format preserving. Uh, the city needs to be a real, a real city and not just a random string. The date of birth needs to be have its own format and of course it needs to be reasonable. You cannot put a date of birth of more than 100 years ago, etc. So this is one capability and is very important for a GDM pool, first of all, to provide different uh, capabilities, different masking capability and different masking rules, but also be flexible and give a flexible framework uh, to enable the user to custom his own masking logic if a specific customized logic is uh, needed in uh, some of the cases. It is also important to keep the referential integrity of the data. For example, if Jane Lee is kept in more than one system, it's kept in billing and it's kept in CRM. So if we make Jane Lee to be Samantha Richards, it needs to be Samantha Richards in billing and CRM and in all the related system. Also, when we have the format preserving, let's assume that the SSN of Jane Lee is with dashes in the CRM, but it has no dashes in the, the uh, billing system. So basically, we need to identify, we need to de define the same SSN value, but with the format, uh, right format. In CRM, we need to set it with dashes, with billing without dashes. So this is very also important capability, and of course, reporting on the internal and external audits. Um, as also Leon mentioned, these capabilities must be applied when we talk about masking. It is not limited on structured data, not only on relational databases, but also on semi-structured data like XML or JSON, CSV, or unstructured data like text files or images, text, for example, the chat. Yeah. Sorry, just one comment because I saw a question uh, here regarding to this uh, yeah. <laughs> this area. Basically, they are asking about uh, uh, nested data using the AVO format. So, for the semi-structured data, just example this kind of format. Of course, AVO should be part of it. So, should mm -hmm. include also AVO. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So all these capabilities, it, it is important not only to identify them, but of course, mask the data. So if we have the JSON in some of the fields, or some of the data in the JSON uh, has a sensitive data, we need to replace it, plant a fake data instead of the real sensitive data. Okay, now let's move data masking versus synthetic data generation. We just talked about masking and basically the masking process 
generates and creates a fake data. This is not the real data. So what is the main difference between the data masking and the synthetic data generation? So the data me this method basically complete each other. The data masking is in, uh, implemented when you have an access to a real data and you would like to mask the PAI field. A synthetic data generation basically generates a whole new entity that does not, in, uh, does not uh, exist in the source data, not only the, mass, the PII fields. So when we will choose the synthetic data, data generation to generate a whole new entity, first of all, when we have no access to the production data, the tester cannot access the production data in order to provision the data. So in this case, we need to generate for the tester, the des tester need to generate a synthetic data that will look like a production data, but is not a production one. And also when there is no available source data at all, new functionality, new system, if there is a new system that we would like to test, we don't have a data yet, so we need to generate a data synthetic data. Also, if we have a new feature, we don't have any customers within the feature because this is new. So in this case, we will need a synthetic data generation as well. Okay, these are, I just want to mention some of the main techniques that are used for a synthetic data generation, uh, real data masking and transformation substitution. These uh, techniques are uh, implemented on real data. Data cloning, this is also an important feature. It enables to get a real entity and replicate it many times in order to accelerate the amount of the testing data. Uh, generative AI, generative AI can be very useful when we have a source data, we can create a training model, we can train the machine learning and create a masked a subset for the training, for the machine learning to build the training model and generate a, a, a synthetic data. And there is a rule based on data manufacturing that can mainly use when we don't have a source data, it's purely based on business rules and business logic. For example, if the user needs to generate X customer that live in California, the customers are mainly female and they have a specific A product. Uh, basically, this method, they do not compete each other, but they compete each other and we can have a hybrid approach, like generate user generative AI in order to generate customer, but calculate the balance of this customer based on the generated payment and invoices. This is just a, an example. Or use the masking in order to prepare a subset for the machine learning. Okay, what are the main pitfalls when we talk about the synthetic data? First of all, it is complex. Complex data relationships, many data sources, many data set subsets, uh, many, many logical relations that need to be identified, that need to be learned, many business rules that must be followed. So it's very complex. Also, it can be potentially inaccurate if mainly when we talk about machine learning, when the training and the learning is based in many statistical uh, representation, statistical patterns. Uh, it incorporates time-sensitive information. It may request a post-generation validation and testing of the data. And also resources uh, intensive and it can be time-consuming mainly in order to run training on a large subset of uh, data. Okay, to you Amitai, to the best practice. Yes, thank you. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit away from technology and talk about best practices for test data management in organizations. Uh, this is largely inspired by Gartner Research, so credit to them. So. First of all, one of the recommendations is to define clear objectives and SLAs. So first of all, we have to treat test data management strategically, which means that um, not to think about test data management as a one-off project that you do once in a decade and, 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 and that's it, but rather something that you do, um, you allocate budget for it every year and uh, and you and you and you can you prioritize it, right? You make it part of the annual budget, and you set up processes and, and internal SLAs for how long it takes for 
testers to receive this data. Now, we see varying levels of proficiency regarding test data management within global enterprises. Just to give a simple example, say you have on two, two teams, software development teams, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast of the, of the United States, and you see one is very advanced in their thinking and their tooling for TDM, and the other is, uh, is not. So um, it's important to share the knowledge internally and if you're adopting tools for TDM and improving the processes, to evangelize the, the importance of TDM internally and to uh, promote a culture of continuous improvement. And next, uh, you need to think about test data management, not just uh, in, in the, with the teams that are um, traditionally engaged in test data management, for example, DBAs and data engineers, and QA teams, of course, but think about all the stakers that are involved uh, in test data management, uh, whether they be coming from the CISO team or the privacy and compliance teams or uh, data governance teams. There are lots of stakeholders for TDM, and we want to uh, you know, do a little roadshow internally and find out what everybody's needs are. For example, perhaps legal has a requirement that all consumers have the right to be forgotten. And so the TDM tool needs to be able to support the deleting of all uh, data when, it, when a customer asks for their data to be deleted. So make sure to involve all the, all the stakeholders that are impacted by the acquisition of a TDM tool. And you also want to create a center of excellence, right? If you're really doing that um, learning up on TDM and establishing best practices for test data management, you want a, a, a center of excellence for TDM that's going to do the research and choose uh, a tool for the organization and then implement, deploy that tool, maintain that tool over time. And you'll want that, that team to train the development and QA teams to, uh, to provision the test data themselves. So in many cases, we, see, we have customers that, um, that have a centralized team that are responsible for provisioning test data. But after they, uh, for example, they, 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 um, they work with K2View, so their job transitions from provisioning the test data themselves to teaching the uh, dev and QA teams to just provision the test data themselves um, and not have to ask for, you know, create tickets for, for test data. So you want to basically spread the word about test data management tooling and uh, best practices internally throughout the organization. And you want to measure the before and after of introducing a tool. So you want to see how much it costs you without a tool and how much it costs you after a tool, uh, measure the benefits, quantify them, and communicate that internally. Okay, so we're now going to talk about K2View solution for test data management. Um, product team, please take it away. Okay. Thank you. Um, we would like to talk about a K2 View test the data management solution and how we handle the main capabilities and how we handle the main challenges that we just uh, display, talked about and described. So basically, K2 View has a patented, a, or the patented model in order to organize data based on business driven entities. In this example, in this slide, uh, we have an entity that is a customer. Basically, the data of these customers in this example, it can be fragmented between many systems. But eventually, the QA team, the testing team, the TDM stakeholders need to get a holistic view of data. If I need to test a customer in an integrative environment, I need to get the data from all the related data system. So first of all, we have the capability uh, to extract the data and organize the data of this each customer from all the related data source system. We have also the capability of data discovery based on our catalog to run a discovery on the different system, identify the relation between the different data sets, identify the PII masking that must be masked and apply automatically masking rules on this PII. 
uh, eventually when we organize the data for on each entity on which a customer in this example the data is being organized and compressed into one micro db in our system we also provide a friendly self-service portal that has uh, many capabilities gives many capability for the consumer of the dvm and for the tester to get this provision data First of all, the way that we organize the data, it makes it easier to run a subset of customer. If the tester, for example, needs to get X customer that live in New York and have a specific product and have also open cases. So in this case, the tester does not need to know where the case is set, the case data, or where the city is set, in which a database, or on which data set, or which data source. Uh, it, the tester can easily open a task in the self-service, get the list of parameters, set the parameter value. In many cases, uh, select the drop-down and values, uh, value values from the drop-down, and by click, ask to get the related subset that is fit for the testing needs. The tester can also create, if there is no real data available, the tester can also create synthetic entities asked to generate synthetic entities on demand. Again, based on the parameter, if I would like to synthetic five customers that live in Arizona, I can do it. Uh, we have also rich uh, transformation capabilities to transform, run transformation on the data before it is being loaded to the source. We just may mention the, the masking of the PAI field, but it's not limited to masking, it can be aging changing of dates or changing on another data, or replacing the IDs in order to avoid a collision. The tester has a capability to reserve the entities to avoid other users from reloading uh, these entities to the shared testing environment, create snapshot to backup the data, and of course, loading uh, the data, provision the data you know, from end environment to uh, the testing the environment from one environment to another. These whole capabilities, of course, they're available and they're supported in our self-service portal, but they are not limited to our self-service portal. We also provide a list of APIs, uh, REST APIs that can be also used by external applications like DevOps engineer, DevOps ACD pipelines, or some external applications uh, if the organization would like to use an external uh, application just to run the task uh, execution to execute a predefined task, this is also possible. Basically, we can we are available and we enable to use our TDM in both modes. Now, Leon, can you please tell us more about uh, the different methods that k 2 view uses uh, for, in order to generate a synthetic data? Yes, thank you, Tali. So basically we support, I will not uh, repeat all the different techniques because uh, Tali already covered it, but basically k 2 view support all these four techniques like the data masking and transformation, to clone data, use a rule base in order to generate the synthetic data, and use a generative AI. Um, what you need to consider is basically for each one of these techniques, what is the basically the use case? So if you are talking about a stress test, for example, so it's better to use data cloning. If you, your use case is basically to generate some synthetic data, but you don't have a reference uh, production environment, for example, uh, if you want to introduce a new iPhone, a new branded one, 16, whatever, so you need to define set of rules in order to invent the, the synthetic data because it does not resist on that production environment. So basically here you can see on this slide some use cases and what should be the technique for each one of them. In some of the cases, you need also to consider some uh, a kind of a hybrid uh, solution like using several techniques uh, for uh, the use case. For example, let's assume that I'm using a generative AI in order to create some synthetic data for finance industry. So I create the invoices, payments, etc. But in order to uh, calculate the balance of the customer, I can use a rule-based technique because this is not something which is based on AI ML. Basically, I need to take all the synthetic uh, payment and invoices and calculate the balance accordingly. 
Leon, okay. sorry, sorry to interrupt. We're, we're really out of time. I apologize. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Um, we're, we're out of time, guys, and we didn't get to your questions. So let me just summarize this, this slide that Leon was talking about. Basically, at K2View, our approach is not to pick one particular synthetic data generation approach. We, we have an all-in-one platform that includes data masking and, and four different synthetic data generation methods. So we basically provide you with a toolbox and you can pick the right tool for, for the right job. So uh, you guys submitted a lot of interesting questions about um, synthetic, synthetic data, a couple of questions about subsetting. Uh, you can either reach out to me uh, by email. I sent you an email invite uh, that where you registered. Uh, there was a question about ROI. We did a webinar on, on TDM ROI, but um, We'll, uh, we'll have to leave it here and we'll get back to you and follow up with you directly with to, uh, to all of your questions. And again, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to go to uh, the K2View website, uh, k2view.com. And uh, you can you know, request a demo or, or uh, contact us with any more questions that you may have. And we thank you very much for participating and look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Tali. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you audience, for participating. Take care.